<laughs> how many remember the song, or how, how many remember John Denver? How many here remember John Denver? What was his favorite song? The one he's most noted yeah. for? Country, Country, Country Roads. Country Roads, Take Me Home Where? West to West Virginia. Okay. Well, this is about a West Be careful. Virginia. Be careful. <laughs> we got a West Virginian amongst us. There was this uh, preacher in his church, and he was concerned about the children in the church. And so he wanted his Sunday school teachers to teach him about heaven, about how to get to heaven. And so he, was, he thought, well, maybe they're doing okay, but he wanted his teacher to ask these kids, and just like five or six years old. And, and so the teacher asked the kids, he said, you know, if I was to give all my money, sell all I had, and give everything to the poor, would that get me to heaven? And the kids, the whole class, you out, no, no, that won't get you to heaven. <coughs> and he said, okay, well, well maybe they do know, know what it means, uh, what heaven's all about. So he said, let me ask you another question. So the Sunday, this was a lady Sunday school teacher. She said, if I was to do good all the time, help everybody that I can help, and just do everything right, would that get me to heaven? And the class again, you out, no, no, that won't get you to heaven. So... This time, you know, the teacher's feeling really good about herself. She said, okay, well then. He said, how do you, see, how do you get to heaven then? She wanted to make sure the kids knew how to get to heaven. She said, how do you get to heaven? What's the way to heaven? And one little five-year-old boy said, move to West Virginia. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> That's Almost six, heaven. That's a segue on to the way, the way to heaven. <laughs> it's through West Virginia. Amen. Amen. Can't argue with that this morning, you know? Can't argue with that at all. You, uh, you're a peculiar people, the scripture says. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 9, Peter says you are a chosen people. He says you're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. But I like the way King James says, he says you are a peculiar people. Peculiar people. Now, before you came to know Jesus, some of you were peculiar. Most of you were ordinary, average, but some of you were peculiar. But once you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you became, as King James says, peculiar. Now, you can take that word peculiar a lot of different directions, but it translates into God's special possession. We belong to God. We, we, we belong to Him, and, and because of that, we are to lift up praises to God. Because of what He has done for us. He has taken us from the darkness. And He has brought us into the wonderful light. So we are to praise Him for that. <laughs> but we are a different people. We have been chosen by God. To do good works. To do the good works where... where we do things for other people, whether they're Christians or not. If we find a person in need, a family in need, a situation, by and large, the Christian community are the first to respond. To help your neighbor, to lend to your neighbor, to give to your neighbor, whether they believe in Jesus or not. Because, as a Christian... You have been called to do good works. And once you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you became a different person. You are not that same person you were before you accepted Christ. And through that, we just do things for folks. We see a need and we do our very, very best to fulfill that need. We see a family that's hungry. We try to feed them. We see a family that doesn't have clothing. We try to put clothing on their back. We see a family just in need, and we're there to do that. It makes us different. 
Yes, people out in the world will do those things, but by and large, and I missed the Sunday school class, but I've talked about three minutes of it. I think Jesse was talking about that a little bit this morning. By and large, the world doesn't do that. It's the church that does that. And that makes us different. That makes us different. So open your Bibles with me, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18. And we're going to look at the first ten verses. In our call to worship this morning, Buddy Red says, Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. I appreciate your song that uh, Sonny had in our bulletin this morning. It fits right in, in line with what we're going to be talking about. So in Jeremiah chapter 18, Jeremiah being a great prophet of God, he was one of the prophets that the people didn't listen to, that they tried to kill. The kings hated him. But yet he spoke what God told him to speak. So chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. When the word of the Lord came to me, he said, can I not do with you, Israel, as the potter does, declares the Lord? Like clay in the hands of the potter, so are you in my hands, Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, destroyed, and if that nation, I warned, repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at any time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended for it. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. Now, Lord God, we just pray and ask that we're able to take your word into our heart. Lord God, I pray that you speak through me this morning as you have spoken to me this week for what you want the church to know today. May we have that receptive heart, Lord God, to hear your word. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So Jeremiah, he is commanded to go down to the potter's house to observe the potter. Now, as a school administrator over the years, I've been very blessed. I've had some excellent art teachers. Excellent art teachers who were artisans. They truly were. And, and, and I, I can remember about four of them who could literally take a lump of clay and put it on the wheel and design pottery that was just absolutely amazing. Has anyone ever put a lump of clay on a wheel to try to form anything out of that. I've tried it. I've stuck it what I thought would be in the middle, and it just went round and round and never centered. But yet these artisans, they just know how to put it right where it belongs. And, and they would take that clay, and, and, and they'd get their hands wet, and, and in just a matter of minutes, they're forming this clay into something that, that they, they bring it up high and then they and then they then they just fold it and put their thumbs down in it and they get their hands wet again and next thing I know they have their whole fist in that pot and that pot's spinning and things are forming and developing and, and, and it's a magnificent thing to watch. And I've tried it and I can't do it. In our reading with Jeremiah, he goes down to the potter and God is teaching him the lesson to tell to Israel that, that, that God himself, the Lord, the Lord is the potter. Now he's talking to the nation Israel, but instead of Israel, put your name in that place. Because it's God himself who's taken your individual life 
And He is forming you on a daily basis. Now, one thing that's interesting about a potter and making pottery is that they will do that and, 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 and they will take that pot or that, that clay and they will form that pot in a matter of minutes and then they will fire it in a kiln at about 1800 to 2000 degrees and then it's over with. But God takes this lump of clay, which is you, and He forms it. But it's a lifetime process. See, He's not finished with me yet. He's not finished with you yet. He's still working on you to make you into who He wants you to be. So it took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the moon and Jupiter and Mars. Hey, someone should write that down. I might put that into a song. <laughs> you know? But he's working on you daily. Daily. God is a great creator. We find that out when we go back in the very, very beginning of God's Word in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Where it says, in the beginning, God did what? Created. In the very beginning, God created. He is the master creator. He is the one that truly did create the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. And if he did that, he's still working on you. He is still creating you. Later on in, in chapter 1, in chapter 1, he, God, God said the Trinity is present, right? God, the, the Trinity is present. And He said, let us make man in our image. Let us make man. God, that great creator, to form and develop man in His image. We are the image of God. Now, I'm not talking about the physical image. We have all the spiritual images of God. We are formed in His image. But He's creating. He's creating. In the very beginning of chapter 1 of Jeremiah, we go way back to the beginning of Jeremiah, God said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Jeremiah 1 verse 5. You see, God before you were ever born, before you were formed in your mother's womb, God knew you. He started shaping you from the time that you were born to be something special. He has special purpose. So that when we look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that once we accept Him, we do lift up praises to Him. Because He is the one who brought us out of darkness and He brought us into the wonderful light. And for that we are to give Him praise. For that we are to do good works. For that we are to go and visit the sick. We are to visit those who are in the hospital. We are to go visit those who are in jail. We are to go and feed the poor and clothe those who are naked and give shelter to those who don't have shelter. We are to do good works. And when people look at you and say, wow, you're a peculiar person. You say, yes, I am. Because I have Jesus living in my heart. And I am being molded and shaped on a daily basis by the Lord. See, He's not finished with you yet. Sometimes we get to a certain point in our lives and say, well, this is where I'm at and, 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 and I'm too old to do this and I'm too old to do that for the Lord. But the fact of the matter is, you're not. You're not. I don't care how old you are. I don't know who the oldest person is in this room. But you're not too old for God to use you in the way that He wants to use you. But you can't resist. You know, if, when you think of the potter making this special pot and that wheel goes around, and, and I remember watching potters do this, they, they take that, just it's a lump of clay, and they form it really tall. 
And then they put their hand in it, and I'm thinking, boy, you know, that, that it's just going to collapse and fall over because they're making that so thin. And God will do that to us sometimes. He will take us to the point as He forms us and molds us into the image and the person that He wants us to be, He'll make us to the point where we think we can't do it anymore, that we think we're going to break, we think we're going to collapse. You see, God is the master potter. And one thing I know about Him is He will take you to the break. He'll take you to the point of maybe you think you can't do it anymore, but God will never let you fall or collapse. He'll never let you do that. You're His children. He loves you, but He will take you to the point of, of you not sure if you just want to make it or not. Why does He do that? Why does He do that? Well, I think of James in the book of James in chapter 1 where He says, Consider it all joy, brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind, whenever you go through tribulations and hard times, because this is God forming you and you go through these trials and these tribulations and these difficult situations in your life whatever that may be and it, and it seems sometimes like it's always happening to you but he says consider it all joy when these things are happening see God knows the outcome he knows the outcome of the trials and the tribulations that you're going through and that's why we need to consider it all joy because he is not going to let you fall and collapse it's not He's not. God is the potter and He is forming you into the person He wants you to be. And sometimes He has to take you to where you don't want to be. I mean, I'm telling you what, that lump of clay is happy being a lump of clay. But inside this lump of clay, this, this, the artisan will look at a lump of clay and they can envision what they want it to be. God already knows what He wants you to be from the time you were in your mother's womb to form you. So He will take you to the very brink of collapse to make you who He wants you to be. So Paul, or excuse me, James says, Consider it a pure joy, brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, the ability to go on. When our faith is put to the test, we will come out successful. We have to understand and realize that God is not going to let us collapse, but we go through trials and tribulations. But God is going to be there. And you will not fall. You will persevere. He will give you what you need to get through this so that we can be mature and complete and not lacking in anything. Not lacking in anything. potter went down to the potter's house and watching the potter spin and it says that as he was spinning this he says it was kind of marred in his hands so what he maybe initially had intended isn't what it came out in his mind to be so he changed it the potter changed it the potter has the right to do that God has the right to change you and put you whatever he, wherever he wants you to do whatever he wants you to do God's allowed to change his mind he does. So the potter changed what he was making. It formed into something completely different. See, as the potter makes this pot, he is, has his hands inside and his fingers on the outside, and he is feeling this pot to see if there's any lumps in it. He's feeling to see if there's any air bubbles in it. Because if there are, it's a marred piece and he has to start over again. He has to get that lump out. He has to get that air out. He's going to change the way this pot will look. It was put to the test. It has to be put into the kiln. You know, we have to be put into the kiln ourselves. Even though God has never finished with us yet, we still have to go through the fires. We still have to go through those tough times. How in the world are we going to grow mature unless we go through tough times? You know, athletes compete. And, you know, that's my background. So we compete. And we have to prepare for our opponent. We have to prepare for the season ahead of us. But I can't do that. I can't do that if I don't go to practice and work on my game. Pianist. I'd love to be able to do that. I'm not willing to put the time to do it, okay? You were. You were. I wasn't. But you, you, you perfected that and got better and better and better at doing that. You knew what it took. 
You had to practice. Anyone else who plays an instrument knows what it takes to do that. Or any other instrument. Or to be able to sing. Or whatever it is that you do. Whatever it is that you do. Can't, can't just... It's just not going to happen on its own. We've got to work at it. And we get fired. We, you know, God puts us into the fire sometimes, into that kiln. And it's hot. It is hot. You know, too much fire and we crack. Too little fire and that pot will fall apart. And it's done. It has to be just right. And God makes it just right. If we get hot, He's there. He's watching over us. He's taking care of us. He won't let you fall. But we have to trust in Him. We have to put our full faith and confidence in Him with all of our hearts. Do not doubt. Do not waver. Whatever trial you may be going through, whatever heartache you may be going through, don't waver in your faith. Know that God is there. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. You've heard it before. If you know of any scripture, you know that one. That He's always there. He's always there. Sometimes in our life, though, things could be going well, and all you know, we get chipped sometimes. And sometimes, sometimes it gets kind of tough. And, and we can get chipped and we can get broke sometimes. But I want you to know that if you've ever felt chipped or if you've ever felt broke, God is still not finished with you. Not yet. God is able to take and repair the chip in your life. You may even as a Christian have done some wrongs. Things that you would be ashamed if other people knew about. Things that only you may know about. And God but God is a great restorer. He is the great fixer. No matter what you may have done, no matter how broken you may feel you are, God can fix it. We just got to allow Him to fix it. And that may mean having God to reshape us once again to the person He wants us to be. That chip that we have in our life is something that can be used by God for His glory, for you to be a witness for someone else, to someone else. I don't know. I don't know. God is the great, great restorer. He is the artist, the ultimate artist. Jesus was walking along the shore one day. And as he was walking, there were some fishermen out fishing. A couple different boats. One of the fishermen's name was John. He had a brother named James. And they were working for their father over here. And there was an other brother over here, two other brothers over here. One was named Simon, one was named Andrew. And I think they were all partners. But Jesus was walking by, and he looked at them, and he says, Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Come, follow me, Jesus said. And I will make you fishers of men. See, these men could not be fishers of people on their own. They had to allow themselves to be shaped by God. They couldn't do it. They couldn't go out by themselves. And so many times we try to do that, especially in church. You know, so, so many times we, we try to do things on our own and not involve God in church. When we try to go out to witness to other people about coming to church, we forget about God. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. You can't do it yourself. 
You've got to give to God. And he will make you fishers of men. With God, all things are possible. Nothing's impossible for Him. In your life, wherever you're at in your life, whatever your circumstance, all things are possible. But you have got to give it to the master potter and be willing to allow him to mold you and to shape you into the person that he wants you to be. Sometimes it's going to be painful. Sometimes it's going to be hard. He will never let you collapse fall to the point that you cannot be restored because you are his workmanship you are his special design you are unique you are peculiar you're his special possession in Christ Jesus it's just thinking as God being the potter and us being the clay and us sometimes not liking the things that we go through. I, I got, just got to thinking, has anyone here ever been rebellious towards your parents? <laughs> now, uh, let me say, raise your hand. Truly, if you've ever been rebellious, raise your hand. <laughs> you know, we've all, I mean, we've all been rebellious whether you want to admit it or not. We've all been rebellious towards our parents and have done things, you know, that, uh, that we're sorry for. And we realize that at this point, you know, as we're older, the older we are, the quicker we are to raise our hand, I think. Uh, if we've been rebellious to our parents here on this earth, you know, I'd venture to say even those, once you've come to Christ, even if after you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, have you ever been rebellious to your Heavenly Father? You ever rebelled against Him? Yeah, we all have. We all have. I, you know, whether we want to admit that or not, we've all been rebellious towards God. And yet, you know what? Just, just as I was rebellious to my parents, and you've been rebellious to your parents, one thing... I've learned, and I, I know you have too, when you're rebellious to your parents, they still loved you. And just because you're rebellious, they didn't put you out of the family. And just because you were, you were rebellious didn't mean that your mom and your dad didn't try to mold you into the person that you are. And just because you've been rebellious to your Heavenly Father doesn't mean that He quit in his molding and shaping you into the person that he wants you to be. <clears throat> so I was thinking about the prodigal son. We know that story, how the, how the youngest wanted his inheritance from his father, and he took his inheritance. It was given, and, and he went to a foreign country, and he squandered all he had on riotous living, <laughs> whatever that might have been, and he ran out of money. He found himself taking care of pigs had no money, had no roof over his head. He literally lived with the pigs. He even ate what the pigs ate. And he came to his senses and realized, hey, my father's servants, his slaves, have it done and I haven't. I'll just go back home to my father, repent, but to become as a servant or as a slave. And so he left the pig pen, made his way back home, and I'm sure he was pondering in his heart, rehearsing what he was going to say to Dad. He comes over the, maybe out through the woods or across the field, and Dad's on the porch, and Dad sees him. And maybe hears him talking to himself, and says, well, that sounds like my son, but it doesn't look like him. He's all muddy and dirty. But then soon, Dad realizes that that's my boy. And Dad gets up 
and runs. This is a very dignified man, a very man of great wealth. And he literally runs to his son. And just as the son starts saying, Dad, I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Dad grabs him and just squeezes him. Just squeezes him. He loves him. He tells a servant to go get the family robe. To go get the ring. Because that ring signifies the family. And whatever that boy would do would be done as the family. And put sandals on his feet because slaves did not have sandals. Put sandals on his feet. Slaughter the fatted calf. Get the best year we've got. We are going to have a party. Invite the whole town. For this son who was dead is alive again. Because he's still working on you. God loves you with a love that is undefinable. Unconditional. He's still working on you. Even after you've sinned and gone astray and rebelled against Him. He's still working on you. Don't think that you've wandered off so far and that you cannot come back to Him because you can. And when you come back, just know that He's still working on you. Making you who He wants you to be. Not necessarily what you want to be, but who He wants you to be. Because you're His child, and He loves you. Please never forget. He loves you.